first of all, um, welcome you guys. And uh, we're going to, um, this is like our third webinar for AXA. So um, yeah, and it's just great to have you here and great to have our, our next presenter. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the country on which we're all um, finding ourselves at the moment and the traditional custodians of that land. That land is really important to us because a lot of the talks we do here are related to the land. And today it's the ocean. Um, so you may already know that AXA um, is a, a, the Australian Citizen Science Association. And um, that means that it's the practice um, of everyday people um, engaging in science and it gives uh, you know citizens the opportunity to participate in scientific research and collaborate with scientists um, and if you'd like to learn more about AXA you can become a member which is always awesome because you get to hear all the great stuff that AXA does with their community and um, with our community and also uh, you can also join pro projects through our website as well so I encourage you all to um, join us so you get to know more about what great projects are out there and how you can become a citizen scientist. Uh, just for housekeeping purposes, I'd like you all to be muted and we've muted you already. So please don't unmute. <laughs> uh, and we're gonna have um, a chat open so you can ask any questions in the chat. And once Wally um, finishes speaking, we'll moderate some of the questions so you can actually um, get your questions answered. And we will finish at 8 p.m. sharp just to respect everybody's time. Um, and I will also invite you, you will get a link um, to, uh, to a survey that we would like you to fill out. And it only takes a couple of minutes, but it really helps us to know what you'd like to see in the future and other things. So it really helps us to improve the gift that we're give, giving here. So please do fill out that survey. And also just to remind you that we are recording this session. So if you love the talk, you can actually then give a link to, to link to a friend so they can watch it as well if they've missed it. And um, yes, and we'll also ask you uh, so we can increase our bandwidth for all of us to turn, except for Wally, to turn off um, our videos. And um, without further ado, I'll introduce Wally. Uh, so Basically, um, Dr. Wally Franklin uh, has been studying humpback whales for the past 30 years um, and initially as a citizen scientist and then has done his PhD. And Wally and his wife, um, Dr. Trish Franklin, have um, set up the Oceania project uh, in, 80, in 1988. And um, that includes a long-term study of the humpback whales um, in Harvey Bay. And um, Basically, Wally will talk to us about um, his research and the use of photo identification as a research method for humpback whales and the emergence of um, artificial intelligence algorithm photo matching platforms and how they can be utilized to by citizen scientists to contribute to whale research. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Wally Franklin. Thank you so much for coming on board and it's if the floor is yours. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'll I'll share my screen. Let's see if we can get that part of it working okay. Is that all working okay? Yes, well, it good is. E good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for in inviting me to be involved in this uh, seminar. And uh, as you can see from the screen, my subject matter is the uh, amazing humpback whales of Harvey Bay. Uh, and in this short presentation, I'll talk about uh, the use of science to study uh, this amazing group of whales and of the emerging power of citizen science uh, using in particular an AI algorithm platform called Happy Whale. So I, I add my uh, acknowledgement to country. We, uh, we acknowledge the Butchula people, uh, traditional custodians of the lands and waters of Gari, formerly Fraser Island, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And uh, I dedicate this presentation to my uh, beautiful partner, Dr. Trish Franklin, who uh, studied the humpbacks uh, with me for 30 years. And, um, and produced uh, 30 peer-reviewed scientific papers publishing the outcome of that work. We'll talk a bit more about that during the presentation. So just by way of context, I just very briefly like to introduce the subject of the presentation and that is the humpback whale. 
Humpback whales are ancient marine mammals. They were evolved to their present form between 12 to 23 million years ago. The humpbacks are one of approximately 86 species of cetacea, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And there are two primary categories, uh, baleen uh, or filter feeding whales and tooth whales. And the humpback is one of the baleen whales. And over on the, the bottom, right here there's some images the humpback is at the bottom the largest whale there is the blue whale and then you have the bowhead and right at the top so the humpback's up there in terms of uh, size amongst the baleen whales it's a medium-sized baleen whale that grows up to 15 meters in actual fact the longest one caught during the whaling days at byron bay was 18 meters they have a body mass of about 50 tonne, but you must remember that whales live and exist in neutral buoyancy. The only way they experience gravity is like young Birakino here to throw themselves fully out of the water. Humpbacks live for about a hundred years. That's, that's the now pretty well established as the lifespan of humpbacks. Females can give birth every two years on average, and many of the whales that we've been watching now for 30 years are, are, are producing calves at that rate. And humpback whales do not experience menopause, so it's possible that they can continue uh, giving birth to calves uh, well into their life. The humpbacks in the southern, there are humpbacks in all oceans of the world, they're split between the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, they migrate annually between tropical breeding grounds. In our case, the breeding ground is the, is the waters of the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon um, off both Mackay and Rock, Rockhampton. Um, uh, and they uh, travel uh, annually to uh, the Antarctic area for feeding. And humpbacks feed on Antarctic krill. And there's a little picture here of an Antarctic krill. That's about the real size of the krill. They bloom in incredible numbers on the phytoplankton, which are the oceans of uh, the sea. I'll say a bit more about the oceans of the sea a bit later on. Humpbacks um, are, co are considered a fission fusion society. They travel in relatively small groups or pods. The longest uh, known association between individuals is the association between a mother with the calf. The mother spends about a year with the calf, but in that year, the calf has to learn everything it needs to survive as a whale. Like all cetacea, humpback whales are ocean echo engineers. And what I mean by that is that through their process of eating and the natural functions of their body, they return nutrients and basically fertilizer to the ocean ecosystem. And even when they die, their bodies decompose and return the nutrients to the ocean. So all whales and dolphins are, are an important component of the complex ocean ecosystem. And uh, a lot of young scientists recently have been doing a lot of work actually quantifying the degree to which uh, whales and dolphins contribute to the health of the ocean eco ecosystem. Finally, humpbacks have a complex social organization. And the main feature of their social organization is the, the fact that they sing. And uh, humpbacks sing the same song every year. Uh, and they go down to Antarctica and return. And when re they return, the song has changed but the whole group changes to the new song. So the song changed annually and more recent research has shown that the songs are passed between populations moving from west to east. There's evidence that the Western Australian humpback song has moved to Eastern Australia, then the Eastern Australia has moved to New Caledonia and New Zealand. Uh, and then a year or so later, it moves to Tonga uh, and then on to the Cook Islands and finally French Polynesia. So the song moves all the way as passed all the way across the Pacific. 
So humpback whales, in my view, are a great and ancient culture of socially and environmentally conscious beings. We can have a chat about that for the rest of the night, but I'll move on. <laughs> Just quickly, um, uh, we've done our work in Harvey Bay and um, Harvey Bay is now a, a, a predominant location for, for humpback whale watching globally. The first evidence of humans on Gari, formerly Fraser Island, um, the archaeological evidence shows that humans were present there about 5,000 years ago. Very likely they were present a long time before that, but we just haven't uh, got the uh, current archaeological evidence. Humpback whales have likely, because of their age, have likely been migrating past this coast of Eastern Australia for thousands of years. They actually witnessed the emergence and growth of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and then when there was a big change in the ocean levels about 10,000 years ago, the humpbacks using the East Coast of Australia adopted the reef as the breeding area. And not long after that, they adopted Harvey Bay as a habitat. Commercial whale watching in Harvey Bay began in 1987, which is quite late. It was started by fishing charter operators, Brian and Jill Perry, when fishermen showed more interest in the whales present in the bay than the fish that they were supposed to be out there catching. The, the beginning of that um, whale watching activity immediately caused a response from the Queensland government who initiated a, a significant process to establish Harvey Bay as a marine park with one zone, that being a whale management and monitoring zone, and they implemented a research program. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. Harvey Bay was declared a marine park in 1989, and with the implementation of the park, they introduced a whale watch permit system. They introduced whale watch operating, re operating regulations, they developed an onboard educational program in conjunction with the whale watch industry. And they developed a code of ethics of how the whale watch vessels were to operate around the whales. Subsequent research, which I'll talk more about shortly, uh, revealed that Harvey Bay is actually a globally unique whale watch destination. And the whale watch fleet conducted 30 years of very high quality whale watch tours and as a consequence of that, Harvey Bay was accredited as the world's first whale heritage site by a group based in England called the World Cetacean Alliance in October 2019. So the World Cetacean Alliance essentially declared Harvey Bay the whale watch capital of the world. Well, as I said, the government uh, in 87 initiated an early research program in, in the late 80s and early 1990s. It was conducted for Queensland Parks by uh, the University of Sydney under the direction of Professor Michael Bryden, um, who led the uh, veterinarian section down at the University of Sydney. And a young academic, uh, Dr. Peter Corcoran, was engaged to uh, undertake and publish the research outcomes. There was also a group from Hawaii called the Pacific Whale Foundation. They began work uh, very early in Harvey Bay as well. And they were led by Dr. Paul Forrestal, a chap called Greg Kaufman, who was the founder of Pacific Whale Foundation and the Queensland uh, academic, uh, Dr. Milani Chalupka. The early, the early work involved aerial surveys of the whole of Harvey Bay um, and which runs right across the top, if you can see my mouse moving. The, that early aerial research established that uh, humpback whales uh, that, that, that move along the primary migratory, migratory pathway, which in this diagram is the block called A, a proportion of those whales around about uh, well, they said 20 to 50 percent, but I'll I'll give you a more accurate figure shortly. A proportion of the whales migrating divert and come into Harvey Bay. They aggregate in the in the northeast corner of the bay against the 
western shore of Gary, formerly Fraser Island, and they leave the bay to the north. They can't get through the Standish Straits, it's too shallow, and there are big sandbars all the way across the bottom of the bay anyway, which they only, only a few come over at any particular time. The early research showed that there were low and variable number of humpback whales in the late 80s and early 90s. They did uh, estimate that anywhere from 20 to 50% of the population was using Harvey Bay. And there were some early work showing that there were behavioral responses by the whales to the whale watch vessels. But fundamentally, that early research provided insufficient data to determine classes of the classes of humpback whales using Harvey Bay. And Dr. Peter Cochran, in his published work, reported that there would be a need for at least a five year program of what's called photo identification to obtain data on individual whales. Uh, and that's what would be needed to answer that question. So the big question, that Trish and I faced and realized um, was there when we arrived in Harvey Bay. We, we first arrived here in 1989 and did a six week expedition with a 100 year old sailing ship out in the bay. And very quickly we tuned into what, what was known from that early research work. We got to meet Dr. Peter Corcoran and to this day he's still a friend. He was here at our house only a few weeks ago. And um, uh, we took the decision after that six week visit in 89 to initiate a long-term photo identification study of individual humpback whales. We initially wrote a scientific proposal to the Queensland government suggesting that we do a 10 year study. And that 10 year study has turned into a 25 years study and, and a 30 year commitment uh, to being with the whales in Harvey Bay. During that 25 years where we conducted the formal research program that we put up to the Queensland government, Dr. Trish Franklin has pictured here, observed and photographed 7,300 po uh, humpback pods and 17,006 individual humpback whales, uh, an amazing uh, effort indeed. Uh, in the, uh, Trish and I did the work, uh, we began the study in 92, we worked throughout the 90s. It wasn't until the end of the 90s that we decided to uh, re-enter the university system because we realized that if we were going to uh, get what we were learning published, um, the university environment was the best environment to do that. So we began work uh, at Southern Cross University. They, they um, very uh, uh, synchronistically formed a, a whale group. And we were living in Byron Bay at the time, which was just uh, the university was just 40 minutes away. And we both began work on PhDs with our photo ID work in 2004. It took Trish eight years to complete her PhD. It took me two years longer, but we both uh, completed our PhDs and were able to incorporate uh, almost uh, all of what we'd learned from the photo ID work that we'd done. And overall, the results of our long-term study have been published in 30 peer-reviewed scientific publications which are all available on Google citations. And if there's any paper there that captures your attention, um, just go to our uh, the Oceania Projects website and send me an email and I'll happy get you a copy of the paper. So how did Trish go about answering that big question? And the question we were tackling was, who are the whales using Harvey Bay? And then there was a secondary question of, why are they using Harvey Bay? So extra to extract data from the observations and the photography of the 17,000 plus humpback whales, Dr. Trish Franklin undertook manual analysis of the pho photography using a unique categorization system for photo identification. Now, if you're interested in that system, she published uh, how she did it 
in a paper in the Journal of Cetacean Research of Man and Management in 2020. The uh, analysis that she it took every year, we'd come up here for 10 years, she'd do the photography, we'd go back to Byron Bay, and Trish would work for the rest of the year. It was an in intensive and incredible manual task of, uh, of sifting through the hundreds of thousands. She took probably in excess of a half a million pictures uh, of the group. And, and what she extracted from that was a catalog of flukes. Now the tail fluke of a humpback is quite extraordinary. The one you see on the screen here is a, a whale we've been watching for 30 years. She's called Nala. She's a very regular uh, every other year breeder. And those marks that you see, those black marks on her fluke haven't changed a bit in 30 years. You'll see some more pictures of that in a little while longer. She still, if you see her in the bay on your next whale watch trip during September in Harvey Bay, you'll recognize her immediately because that's exactly how she looks today. And that's exactly how she looked when we first filmed her from our, our uh, research ship in 1992. Now, um, Trish, extracted individual ID of 3,339 discrete individual humpback whales. And over the 25 years, she observed those whales over just under 6,000 times. She also using those 5,000 sightings because there were resites of individuals, she built a database of 683 individual reciting histories ranging in length from two to 25 years. Uh, and Nala is a classic example, and she is a now a, a 30 year uh, visitor in, in terms of photo identification to Harvey Bay. This turned out to be one of the largest, if not the largest humpback whale photo identification data sets in the seven uh, Southern hemisphere. And it represented at about 10% in, in when the work was finished around about 2017, it represented about 10% of the population at that time, which made it a superb sample of data, which enabled us to undertake studies of pod characteristics of the humpbacks, the social organization of the humpbacks, the biology and social behavior. We're able to estimate abundance, how many whales, and we're able to look at the population dynamics and migratory movements. So I've used this word photo identification. What is it? Let's just focus on that for a sec. Now, what's happened to my machine? Okay. Th this is a good example of what we mean by photo identification. This set of flukes uh, is uh, uh, illustrates the main categories in Trisha's categorization system and all the information about how many of the whales flukes fitted into these categories as in that paper I mentioned, the 2020 paper. And um, uh, you can see that the, you can just see by looking at these flukes, how different they are. And um, Many of these whales uh, we know quite intimately from histories. There's one, um, uh, uh, the, the one that's um, second down in the second column is a whale that we know very well along with Nala and I'll come back to her a bit later in the, uh, in the uh, uh, presentation. The photo identification was realized by two young scientists in uh, North America, Steve Katona and Hal Whitehead, uh, realized that the natural markings on the underside fluke provided enough information to be able to identify individuals. Humpbacks have a couple of very interesting characteristics. One of them is that the trailing edge of that fluke has serrations and humpbacks are the only whale or dolphin that has such serrations. The other characteristic of the humpback is that it has very long petrol fins, which are, are about the same proportion of the human arms to the human body, uh, whereas all other whales and dolphins 
only have um, door, uh, have fins which are basically arm's length in, 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 in relatively. So humpbacks are quite interesting in that regard. And because of that, Another scientist, another couple of scientists, Shane and McSweeney, worked out in 1990 that because of these marks, particularly on the underside flute, it's possible to identify 100% of individual humpback whales from the natural marks on the underside flute. But as well, uh, these humpback whales have dorsal fins and lateral bodies. I'll come back to that a little later. So just very quickly, what, what was Trish able to uh, uh, discern from all that data? Now, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, it's in the published papers, but basically in her published work, she was able to show that Harvey Bay is a unique female area. Uh, there are 2.9 females for every male that visits Harvey Bay. So it, it is an important female area. The season in Harvey Bay runs from about mid-July through to the end of October. From mid-July and during August, mature females are the first to come through. And on this graph, you can see that they are actually, there's a big gray block in the middle. Uh, and these are the females non-lactating. So that's the first group that comes through. And those females travel in company with the uh, immature males and females, uh, and an immature male and female in humpback terms is aged from one to six. So uh, the whales that are here from July to August are these mature females traveling in company with the young whales. And the young whales are very interesting whales because they have an incredible interest in life, like our young human uh, teenagers. Um, and they're very interactive with the whale watch vessels. Uh, and quite uniquely, they will stop doing what they're doing as whales and come to the whale watch vessels. About 14% of humpback pods will take time out from being whales to interact with these strange stick-like characters they see aboard the whale watch vessels. The rest of the season from September, October, is dominated by mature lactating females. And that's the dark group on this diagram. Um, and those like mature lactating females are generally uh, uh, traveling with older new seasons calves. The main breeding month for humpback whales is August. And most of the breeding takes place up in the lower part of the reef. And the mature females don't bring, don't start bringing the calves into Harvey Bay until the calves are old and robust enough to begin the migration. And so the, the mothers bring the calves the mothers are bringing into Harvey Bay are, are slightly older and, and a little more robust and getting ready for the journeys, for their first journey south to their Antarctic feeding ground. There are few mature males used Harvey Bay. Uh, and that feature of the uh, female bias and the lack of males is globally unique. There's no report in the Northern Hemisphere amongst humpbacks of female bias. There's one report of female bias off the west coast of um, South Africa in an early feeding area. So that's uh, another two of the unique characteristics. And the other unique characteristic is the mature females with calves in Harvey Bay, um, they spend 70% of their time alone with their calves. And when they do mix with other whales, they're significantly more likely to mix with other mum calf pods. So there's a very important socialization process uh, occurring with these groups in Harvey Bay. Now, I, I won't say much more about the males uh, or the young whales, except to say, that the, the whales that are brought into Harvey Bay as calves return to the bay in the early part of the season during their uh, time from one to six years of age. And as they grow in age, they actually move later in the migration until they get to about six years old when they're socially and sexually mature. 
and they basically start uh, moving as the adults do within the migration. So the migration is an incredible migratory procession. I could uh, I could talk to you all night about the uh, uh, how amazing the humpback migratory procession is and the extent to which it's an incredible social organism. But uh, I need to move on. Just checking my time. Okay. Uh, why do humpbacks use Harvey Bay? It's a suitable early stopover after leaving the breeding grounds. It's a shallow, it has shallow protected waters formed by Gari or Fraser Island. And that shallow water actually does provide the mature females with some protection and avoidance from male harassment. Um, the stay in Harvey Bay provides the opportunity for physical and social development of young whales and new calves and the average time that uh, uh, whales will stay in the bay for their social and physical development purposes is two weeks. And Harvey Bay, uh, we believe, could be an area aggregation for that young cohort of whales uh, and for use by the mothers with new calves. Uh, during the latter part of the season, the mums and calves don't start coming in until early August, and there's about 3% of pods have calves. And between early August and October, the proportion of pods with calves rises from 3% to 90%. Just very quickly, um, that uh, focus there was what we learned from the photo ID in Harvey Bay. We also, using photo ID, can learn about the movement of humpback whales uh, to and among other breeding and other feeding areas. And we did a major project with the um, group called the South Pacific Whale Research Consortium in the early 2000s, where we matched uh, all the existing fluke ID catalogs at that time. And uh, we came up with a set of matches. Those matches confirmed that Eastern Australia and New Caledonia uh, separate populations, but there are low levels of mingling between the populations. Those matches enable us to report for the first time that Eastern Australian humpback whales use the southern New Zealand waters and Cook Strait to and from Antarctic feeding areas. And uh, some matches that Trish got from the Bellini Islands enable us to show that uh, the Bellinis are a primary feeding area for waters around the Bellini Islands but some flukes we obtained from Antarctica, which were matched to Eastern Australia, Western Australia, and East Africa, uh, enable us to uh, publish the fact that the whales in, in the Antarctic area underneath Western Australia are likely from Western Australia with some possible mixing between East Africa and Eastern Australia. And there was one uh, particular female with a calf who was satellite tagged off even, and she traveled down the coast of New South Wales through Bass Strait and traveled way to the west down to Antarctica under Western Australia. Uh, and that showed us that the, the breeding area for the, the feeding area for these whales is much more complex than we originally thought. So when Trish began doing her photography of uh, flukes, because that was the way the photo ID work was done, she immediately realized that uh, when you're watching a humpback in the water, you tend to see the dorsal fin and the lateral body uh, uh, more often than you see the fluke. So she decided uh, as part of her work that she'd systematically um, uh, photograph the, do the dorsal flukes and the uh, lateral bodies and uh, she uh, ended up publishing uh, in that 2020 paper I mentioned, uh, she was able to publish the fact that dorsal fin shapes and lateral body marks have equal value in the photo ID process. But up until the time that she finished her work, all the work in the world done on humpbacks was done on the dorsal, on the fluke underside. The, the next issue that faced Trish after the 20 years of work was that as she got towards the end of that, 
uh, the photo ID process was becoming a monumental task because every new whale had to be checked against all the other existing whales in the um, uh, in the um, catalogues. And um, uh, it became quite clear that the manual management of photo identification was reaching a kind of natural limit. Trish and I were aware of facial recogni recognition technology, and uh, we happened to come across some young scientists in North America who, through advances in computer processing uh, of images and development of AI algorithm matching techniques, uh, uh, were developing a computer-based algorithm matching. Uh, and they were also interested in the concept of doing what's called multi-feature matching, where we could incorporate the dorsal fin of an individual and its lateral body marks into the photo ID process. Such techniques um, are now web and cloud-based, and they provide a means for scientists to efficiently match very large photo identification sets. Just uh, in, in this previous slide, the, the, all the blue connections there, that's the North Pacific humpback catalogues. They're quite enormous compared to our Southern Hemisphere catalogues. And they are at the present time in the process of completely uh, reanalyzing it. They did it uh, a couple of decades ago, but they're reanalyzing all the new catalogues now using this new technology. Now, the two uh, groups that we encountered were called uh, Happy Whale and Fluke Book, and I'll come to those. So, so we finally come to the point of citizen science and how it fits into this story. Um, Trish and I began collaborations with two groups in North America. The first was a man called Ted Cheeseman, who's now doing his PhD on his um, algorithm uh, work uh, at Southern Cross University. And he runs a platform called happywild.org, which is a very open access platform that any individual can contribute material to. And then we also started working with Dr. Jason Holmberg of a group called Wild Me, and they run a humpback uh, platform, matching platform called Flutebook. All of Trisha's Harvey Bay Flute catalog has now been systematically loaded onto Happy Whale and onto Flat Fluke Book. And her complete photographic data set is being used to train computers in machine learning um, and to train the algorithms that are being developed by these young men to do the photo matching. Um, the the cloud-based system provides a long-term secure storage base and, and access for uh, not only Trisha's work, but for anybody who's got uh, humpback flukes to contribute. And, and these platforms facilitate collaboration amongst scientists, um, but, fund, but the most important point is that they now open up the possibility for anybody with an iPhone or a camera can contribute to the data on humpback whales if they get pictures of the whales, either underside flukes or dorsals or lateral bodies. And on the right here, the, these are the photographs um, from Trisha's history of Nala ranging, these photographs range from 96 through to 2012. And you can see that in all these photographs, the shapes and, 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 and uh, marks on her fluke haven't changed a bit. So, the availability of these open access platforms does create a means for citizen scientists aboard whale watch vessels in Harvey Bay and along the east coast of Australia to add to recite history data on long lived individual whales like Nala. Now, uh, to give a perspective, in Harvey Bay, there can be anywhere between 40,000 and 80,000 people out on the whales out on the bay interacting with the whales in any one season. And then on top of that, you've got all the whale watch areas along the coast of Queensland and New South Wales. So there's a massive opportunity for citizen science to contribute to our ongoing knowledge of, of, uh, uh, of humpback whales.
Now, this is just one story of hundreds, but this is a member I mentioned a whale early on that I'd give attention to. The whale I focused on was this whale who is called Bluebell. She has those straight marks on the on the left side of her fluke. They're actually orca teeth marks because orcas are a predator of humpbacks. But those marks have been on her since Trish started pho photographing her back in 1997. And Trish photographed her in Harvey Bay in 97, 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2011. And in all those years, except 97, she had a new calf. Uh, now, a few couple of weeks ago, on the 7th of August, the uh, captain of Amaru, one of the whale watch vessels, who started using Happy Whale, photographed Bluebell on the 7th of August in 2022 and he loaded that picture onto happy whale that night and immediately got a email back saying that's a mac a match with dr trish franklin's bluebell fluke now that one photograph extended the recite history of bluebell from 20 uh, from 11 years to uh, 25 years so um, that was an amazing leap in the knowledge we have about this individual whale. And it's the knowledge of the individual whales that will help us in the future. So how can citizen science contribute? Well, uh, the Eastern Australian humpback whales have recovered uh, miraculously from almost being made extinct during the last period of whaling. They've clawed their way back from about 150 individuals survived the last period of whaling in the early 60s. They clawed their way back to a few hundred whales by the late 80s when we began work in Harvey Bay. But between the early 90s and now, the group has recovered extremely well and is now up to about 40,000 whales, which is very close to what we believe it was uh, back in the... Uh, uh, prior to that last bit of whaling. So citizen science via Happy Whale can make a significant contribution to uh, not only studying all the aspects of humpbacks that I've already outlined to you in the work that we've done, but it can move that work forward, but can also allow us to look at the whole of the Pacific Basin because we're getting citizen science involved in photographing humpbacks right across the Pacific and down in Antarctica, because there are a lot of tourist boats now going to Antarctica. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that all, all cetacean species are environmental echo engineers. And they're a very important reflection to we humans at this point in time, who've brought our own uh, living habitat uh, to a very challenging point where if we don't do something smartly and quickly, uh, we could destroy the habitat that supports uh, our life on the surface of the earth and possibly also uh, could affect the whales and dolphins. So human, humans are the key to reversing climate change and each, each and every human must not only become a citizen scientist, but also an environmental engineer. And as well, we have a bunch of new researchers beginning work uh, in Harvey Bay this year. We've got young Melina and Georgina from the University of the Sunshine Coast have started a five-year project on humpback whales and dolphins. A young man called Hansiker did a master's project at SCU. He's the one who loaded all of Trisha's pictures onto Happy Whale. And Pacific Whale Foundation have got a major five-year program of study underway. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you all get the opportunity to come to Harvey Bay with your cameras. Um, Happy Whale does explain uh, what's required with regard to pictures. Uh, so you can find that information there. So I thank you for watching. I, I pay thanks to all the people who supported us on our research expeditions that got Trish and I out there to do the work that we've done. Uh, and I very much appreciated talking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wally. That was so interesting. What an amazing story you guys have, you and Trish. It's uh, 
just breathtaking to be spending all that time with those amazing animals and dedicating your whole lives to it. It's quite a th- quite an achievement. So congratulations. Uh, yeah, I'm going to now um, read some of the questions that we have. So question number one from Roger, do humpbacks ever migrate between southern and northern hemispheres? Um, there's only one area that I'm aware of where that does, where, where they do cross the equator from the southern hemisphere. And that's over uh, on the west coast of South America and Central America. There's a group of humpbacks that migrate up the west coast of, um, uh, of uh, South America from the Antarctic Peninsula. And because of temperature conditions, they actually do move into the um, uh, Northern Hemisphere waters off, uh, the, off Mexico and, um, and the West Coast of America. But all the other groups of humpbacks remain in their Northern and Southern migratory patterns. And of course, the way the world works, when our humpbacks are down in Antarctica, the, the Northern Hemisphere humpbacks are in their breeding grounds of Hawaii and the Caribbean. And when our whales go to the breeding grounds, the Hawaiian whales are up in Alaska and the Caribbean whales are up, up, uh, up, up in Massachusetts. So the two groups of whales move in uh, synchronicity with the seasons uh, and stay separated. There's one very interesting group of whales um, in Oman who do not migrate. They're the only group of humpback whales that do migrate. There's enough food in and around the, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean off Oman where they are and they don't migrate. Hmm. That's interesting. It's so interesting how they have such different um, preferences, just like us. <laughs> There's just such individuals and and those family cultural groups are so amazing. I hope to hear more about that later as well. Um, there's another question uh, that says um, the image seen of supergroups in Eden area of humbacks eating is it krill or are there other foods that supplement their diet? Um, I do believe it is krill off Eden. There's a canyon. Uh, uh, ocean canyon that comes in uh, and actually sperm whales come into that canyon uh, so there is krill off Eden which the whales do um, uh, aggregate there and those super pods are a very recent phenomena uh, we, we've only began seeing them in uh, in very recent times so yes it is krill but humpbacks do uh, supplement their 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 Diet with schooling fish. They do uh, munch on schooling fish. When we, we began the work in Harvey Bay, Trish and I, um, in our observations, uh, thought we were actually watching uh, lunging beh- behavior where the whales would go roll on their side and open their mouth and lunge. And we wondered if they were uh, uh, feeding on uh, bait fish in the bay because there's huge amounts of bait fish throughout Harvey Bay. And uh, what it turned out was that we actually collected solid fecal samples from some humpback whales. We collected about a dozen fecal samples. And what we know about whales is that if they're producing solid fecal matter, they've eaten something in the previous 17 hours. So that was a little bit of evidence that there is a bit of snacking. There's some fast food snacking going on in Harvey Bay. That's sweet. Be lovely to put that under the microscope, that whale poo. Um, So the next question is, when they mate, is there ever interbreeding, example, brother and sister? Uh, That's a very interesting question. And the simple answer is, we, we don't know, but we suspect not. We suspect that the humpbacks have worked out a system uh, and and we, it's a system we do not yet understand. In, in order to understand, in order to address a question, a question such as that, uh, Trish and I began uh, collecting what are called sloth skin, scam- sloth skin samples from the humpbacks back in the early 2000s. 
And that's simply natural skin that falls off the body of the humpbacks. So if a humpback breaches in front of us, we can very carefully move into what's called the footprint where the whale uh, had been surface active. And you very likely will find pieces of skin floating and you can just pick them up with the sieve and then very carefully with gloves, put them into sample containers into um, proper um, uh, liquid to preserve them. And we collected about 1500 samples, but we were so busy over the last 30 years working on our photo ID that we never got to do anything with them. I, originally, I was supposed to do my PhD on genetics, but I didn't get to do it for a whole host of reasons. But believe it or not, we've just done a, a, a collaborative agreement with the University of Sunshine Coast, and we were able to preserve all those samples very securely in uh, our genetics lab at Southern Cross University. They've now all been moved to the University of Sunshine Coast. And one of those young mention, uh, women I mentioned is actually processing that whole data set of sloth skin. And one of the things we'll, we'll be able to look at it, uh, uh, with that is uh, individual relationships. Because with the DNA, we, uh, we can get genetic information. We can tell whether a whale's a male or female and we can start working out relationships. Uh, and we might be able to tackle that question, that, that very sensible question that's being asked. But we do know a lot from the mm -hmm. photo ID. We, we, we know like that young whale, Birakino, that you saw in the presentation. We know Birakino's mother and we know another very famous whale called Floppy. So uh, Floppy was born in 96 and he's a stepbrother of Birakino, who was born in 2001. And we actually got skin from Birakino and skin from, from Yolanda, uh, the, the mother of both those whales. And we were able to show that genetically Birakino was a sibling of Yolanda, but, but was a, a stepbrother to, uh, to Floppy. <laughs> so cool. So cool to know those relationships. So um, the next question is, do you think swimming with whales is a good or a bad thing? Um, we, Trish and I have been advocates against swim with whales since the moment it was proposed. Um, the reason for our advocacy, adv advocacy against it was based first of all on the public risk that was involved. Uh, we think it's a highly risky activity. Uh, secondly, as far as Harvey Bay is concerned, Harvey Bay is a shallow sandy bay with three metre tides. So the, the clarity of the water is very poor. So you're never going to get a, a decent swim with an opportunity anyway. And the third reason we were against it is because swim with is totally inconsistent with the very successful vessel-based whale watching in Harvey Bay. Um, there's now quite a lot of evidence that um, the swim with uh, does uh, have a, a, a deeper impact on the social behavior of humpbacks. There's also growing evidence of incidents of injury that are occurring. There were three very serious incidents of injury in Western Australia. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the place for humans is on board the extensions of the land, which are vessels, and the ocean is the realm of the whales. And, um, um, you know, deep in our hearts, we think we should leave that to them and, um, and watch them from vessels. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we already disrupt so much of the environment and poke our noses into all kinds of places. So I think getting those where that they're supposed to be, um, this would be a helpful thing to just watch them from afar and wave and and scream with joy like I've done once when I went <laughs> while watching. Um, well, this, there's this one time, question that I'm next dying time to you ask go is, take your camera with you. <laughs> oh yeah, and I did, I did. Yeah, yeah, no. But I'll, I'll be looking for those butterfly wings sticking out more now. <laughs> um, there's one question that I'm dying to ask, and that's to do with the barnacles on them. 
Are they yes. like a symbiotic relationship? Or, yeah, or, yes. Um, the, or do it, they bother it, the whales or what's going on there? No, it is symbiotic. The barnacles attach themselves to feed from the water flowing around the whale's body. And the barnacles attach in colder waters, I think, um, and then do fall off in warmer waters. And that leaves marks on the body, particularly on the underside fluke. You'll often see uh, little dots and little rings uh, but they're what, what Trish called tertiary marks because they can change over time. Whereas the fundamental marks that you're seeing on a fluke like um, Nala's don't change. But dots, uh, rings and scratches, which do occur when a, when a humpback uh, is scratched on a, on a area of black pigmentation, white pigmentation shows. So that's you saw that from those orca teeth marks on bluebells. Uh, fluke. Mm. All right. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to delve more deeply into um, uh, barnacles, there's there is lots of papers about it, but it is symbiotic. Yes. Sandra, sorry, are you there? Mm, yeah, it makes sense. So, how do they hunt them? Do they like pack? Yes. I'm here. Oh, did I just drop out or something? Yeah, sorry. I dropped just out. checking. Uh, yeah. Just wondering about how orcas feed on whales because they're larger um, the whales, aren't they? They, um, they hunt in packs. Than the orcas. I'm skipping some. Yeah, the, the orcas, uh, we believe, follow the humpbacks and got no time, but... up during the uh, migration. They operate uh, in packs uh, and, and they will often try and separate a calf from the mum and then they'll drown the calf by, by putting the weights of their bodies on uh, it. Uh, and then all they eat of right. the humpback is the tongue. Oh, but they, they will no. snap away. They'll snap away at the... Uh, uh, in that 2020 paper, Trish reported that 8% of Harvey Bay humpback whales have orca rake marks uh, on either their flukes or their bodies. So there's quite a, quite a relationship going on between the orcas and humpbacks, but orcas will never be a threat to the population. They're, they're just a, um, uh, a social nuisance that the humpbacks have wow. to deal with it's during their similar. migratory journey. Yeah. yeah. No. Mm, it's kind of like a shark fin soup. It reminds me of when you just take shit, you know, the fins and waste the rest. One last question. We've got two minutes. Yeah. Um, is there anything happening in the citizen science landscape contributing and analyzing photos of whale flukes up and down the coast? Often see humpback whales in bus strait while um, fishing. This is from yes. Jeffrey. Yes, there are a number of projects already underway. Um, two young women from Griffiths University uh, have done projects um, uh, looking at the humpbacks in Morton, in Morton Bay and Harvey Bay, and they used Happy Whale uh, for the data that they needed for their work. Um, I mentioned uh, Hansik Abadhu from Southern Cross University. He's he completed his master's after um, um, after um, loading Trisha's catalog onto Happy Bay. He then did a rematch of all the Harvey Bay flukes on Happy Whale with all the other catalogs across the Pacific and down in Antarctica on Happy Whale and has produced a, uh, a master's report on that. And he's in the process of publishing that. Um, he's actually got quite a good presentation. He could talk to you about that. And the uh, mm -hmm. the, the people, uh, uh, PWF, have also an amazing catalogue of humpback whales. That's all now been loaded on happy whale. So uh, any citizen science scientist that contributes to happy whale, um, their material will be available to to scientists looking at a whole range of questions about relationships between the groups across the Pacific and migratory movements and 
and connections between breeding and feeding grounds. Yeah. So the data will get used. And if citizen scientist data is used, um, I, I'm not quite sure yet of the protocols, but it certainly would be acknowledged by the people who are using that data. Uh, whether uh, people could be acknowledged individually by name uh, may, may be a bit problematic, particularly if there are thousands and thousands of them, but certainly it would be recognized that um, citizen, the, the, the proportion of uh, data that came from citizen science would be acknowledged in the papers and analyses done by these upcoming young scientists. Mm, fantastic. So good that we can contribute. Eh? It's such an amazing world right now where it's just so exciting that, yeah, anyone can do science with scientists and learn to be a scientist through that. Uh, there's, the project is actually on uh, AXA's uh, website, the um, Whale Project. Um, one of the, and there's a link in the chat. Um, there's one question that's last, and we're probably going to finish after this. But do you recommend any specific ethical um, sort of whale watching companies that we could go and do this with? Um, look, um, pretty well all the whales watch operators that are operate operate along the coast of uh, New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland. Um, they're, they're all doing uh, good work. I can certainly recommend uh, any of the operators in Harvey Bay who've established very high standards of operation. Um, they have on good onboard interpretation and they operate to an agreed code of ethics of how they operate in and around the pods. And uh, the evidence from the work that Trish and I has done uh, clearly shows that uh, there is evidence in our work which shows that um, uh, the proportion uh, of pods with calves has remained constant over the last 20 years, which is a good indication that the whales have acclimatized to the whale watch vessels and um, know that those whale watch vessels here in the bay uh, are no danger to them. Mm, that's so good to know. Um, does the code of ethics extend to the swim with whale vessels? Oh, I didn't there, even realize there, there are. Also a very well, there, there's only one operator doing swim with in Harvey Bay. Most of the operators have realized that it can't work with uh, normal vessel based whale watching. Um, you know, so uh, it's a niche market. It probably only represents about one or two percent of whale watch revenue in the bay. The primary income from whale watching in the bay is from the vessel based whale watch operators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of, um, there's one last question, but we're out of time. But, and I'm also curious about this one. Um, so, how do you collect whale poo? <laughs> I like um, that one. We, we just uh, use the same sieve that we were using for um, uh, sloth skin. Um, and it was quite uh, some of the samples. Uh, most of the whales that, that uh, poo in the bay, it's very uh, watery, but some were pooing solid samples. And you could just pick it up like any other poo and get some Great. Um, gloves and and a um, little pair of tweezers and, and get it into the sample bottles. So it's a yeah. very uh, useful way because you can learn a lot from the poo. You can actually look at the DNA mm -hmm. of what they may have been having um, takeaway snacks on. It's a fantastic idea because you can analyze a whole ecosystem from the poo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The whole ocean ecosystem because they're such a, well, they're not a big predator, but, you know, they're eating a lot of... Um, stuff because they're so big so they probably have a lot of bycatch in them as well <laughs> um yeah look i don't want to take any more of your time wally uh, i want to respect that and it's already five past but we thank you so much uh for joining us and explaining all the beautiful project that you've projects that you've been engaged in and um yeah we really appreciate you being here we're all very grateful the comments are coming in constantly saying how wonderful it has been to have you on the show <laughs> It's not a show, but you know. Um, yeah. Is there any comments you'd like to add before we all leave? 
No, I just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I hope I didn't speak too long and 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 uh, but um, if anybody has questions, I, I'm that you can find my email address on the Oceania Projects website and please don't hesitate. I love talking about whales, as you probably gathered. <laughs> so I'm happy yeah, to answer any I would questions. Really... Yeah, I'd really love to hear you speak um, at some other point about this migration that you've been so fascinated with, because yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people would be very interested to hear. And you said you can talk all night. So, you know, <laughs> about that particular topic. <laughs> so we won't um, take any more of your time now. Thanks so much, guys, for joining us. We're going to send a link out so you can do a survey, um, just a two minute thing to let us know, you know, about what your ideas are for more of these webinars. And um, we're going to thank Wally one more time. And thanks so much for my support crew in the background who's been doing an amazing job as well. See ya, Wally. Thank you so much, guys.